Okay, my computer says I'm live, so let me test my connection really quick. I have an excellent connection. It looks like my microphones are on. I fixed that. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, we are here today. It is Sunday, December 4th, and I am super excited. Fix my camera here. That you're joining me. Oops, and I have a live, so that you are joining me for um, month nine of the Dresden Project. So the Dresden Project began in April, and the purpose of this quilt along is to teach you different ways to use the Dresden to make a variety of different flowers. And so when people think Dresden, they think of a typical traditional Dresden. So this entire series has been a skill builder um, and so I'm going to go through everything that we've done so far, like a quick recap, super quick. Um, but before I do all of that, I just want to say welcome. So we have a new person that's with us live for the first time, and her name is Leslie from Utah. Welcome, Leslie. Um, and I am also going to answer questions from Victoria Lip. She had questions from the last time that we were together. She wasn't sure how to finish her forget-me-not. So I'm going to review that as part of this lesson because this lesson builds upon that previous lesson. So, all right, it is two o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and switch my camera so that you guys can see my hands and we'll get started. Let's see, who do we have out there? Hi ladies, we have uh, Alicia from Texas, we have Deb, we have a lot of people, Victoria, Veronica, we have Deneen, welcome Leslie, we have Sonia and lots of other people. We've got um, almost 50 people with us online right now, so we've got a lot of friends out there. If this is your first time joining us, please be sure to leave a comment. I try to go back and answer all of your questions um, because the purpose of these activities is for you to learn something new or refresh something that you already know. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, I'm switching my camera, friends. I'm gonna switch, okay. So this is the block that we're building today. And so month nine is December and it's a poinsettia. Um, this poinsettia, if I measure it, um, will end up being about seven inches across from point to point. When I started drafting this block, I made a seven and a half inch circle and then I wanted nine points, so I made I measured 40 degree angles from the center because the circle is 360 degrees. And from there, I just began kind of drafting all of my bits, but I wanted them to have a curve. And so this is gonna be a little bit of a challenge for you if you've never curved pieced before, but this is the easy way because we're gonna use uh, English paper piecing just like we did last month to make that little flower. We're gonna use English paper piecing to make the primrose. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Where are we now? So I'm just gonna lay a piece of navy fabric. So this is my background that I'm gonna be using for my flower garden. So as you can see, it's a, a dark navy and it has like a little bit of a floral print. Um, and the first thing that we did was we made a traditional Dresden. And let me pull this up just a hair. So we just need a regular Dresden, and I showed you guys how to do that. I used batiks. So these are two Dresdens. One is a little bit um, smaller than the other, but these are the basic, um, basic Dresdens that you see everywhere. And that's what we made in April. We made, uh, drafted our own template. The next thing that we did in this series, and you can go back and watch these if you missed any of them, is we made forget-me-nots. So we made like a partial Dresden, and we made these forget-me-not flowers. Um, they're also known as rudbeckia or cone flowers, and they're going to have um, leaves. And if you noticed, these were just turned edges. So I did one with interfacing and one where the edges were just turned with starch. And you're gonna see when I finish those how pretty those are gonna end up. The next thing that we did was a California poppy, and this is a great big flower. And so this has like a little center and she has like little stamens, just like a California poppy. And um, I inserted these little um, stars inside there. And so that was my California poppy. And we did that in June. 
The next one that we did was my favorite by far, and in July we made a sunflower. And so I pieced that center. Um, I uh, put interfacing on that center and stitched it down. And so this was actually one of my favorite flowers um, that I made back in June. And it's not um, been stitched down. It's just been fused so for now. But this was one of my favorite uh, flowers. The next one that we did, we learned how to layer. The very next thing we learned how to do was a layered Dresden, and so we made a Dahlia. This was my experiment, and so as you notice, these are much smaller than these, so I used two different size templates, but you can certainly use the same size. Um, and so we made a layered Dahlia, and that one was mine. So I made this one, and as you can see, it has the three different layers. And I did a, a video, a follow-up video for this one. So if you missed the live and the follow-up video, there's a, a separate video for this, how to sew the layers together. So those were the next ones that we did. Um, finally, um, after that, in September, we did the little Mexican primrose, and I'm not done with her yet. Um, but she is like a curved edge. I stitched two Jelly Roll um, strips together and then I made these little curvy shapes some people had questions about how to get the little curvy shapes I'm going to review that today as well if you missed that so this is the little Mexican uh, primrose and then the next one that I did after the Mexican primrose was the daisy so the daisy is this flower that has the same color in between as the background because I want it to look just like a daisy. And so that was my daisy that I did for October. After that, we did these little tiny flowers. This was my tester. I always test my patterns with um, scrap. So this was the little forget-me-not. And so that was the next thing that we did. And so before I leave you guys today, I'm going to show you how to remove these papers because the flower that we're doing today, the poinsettia, uses a very similar technique as to the one we did for uh, this little forget-me-not flower. And the only difference between this one and this one is that I folded the centers back. So I took these centers and just folded them back after I pressed it. But they're identical. And so if you have not tried some of these, you should give it a try. If you don't want to do an entire quilt, guess what? Take this little flower, turn it into a mug rug, and give it to somebody for the holidays. And they make cute little presents, a little mug rug with just a little flower, a little forget-me-not, give it to your friend. All right, so that's where we are. I love Dresdens. They look beautiful in any colorway. Um, and I especially love them with batiks because they just end up looking very, very pretty. And this is just a regular standard Dresden. All right, friends. So that is the recap of everything that we've done. <clears throat> so I have a question from Sandra. And Sandra says, um, I'm new to sewing. What is a jelly roll? So a jelly roll is a strip of fabric um, that is two and a half inches wide by width of fabric. And so this one is my jelly roll. Um, right here. Some of them come with pinked edges. Some of them do not have pinked edges, but I cut all of my fabrics that are left over from any project, whether it's a border or a backing. I cut everything into two and a half inch strips and I save all of my fabric by color in two and a half inch strips. So you don't see anything in my sewing room that's a scrap that's not a two and a half inch strip. And I have made literally probably 40 or 50 quilts, literally just only using Jelly Roll strips. And so that's how we became the Jelly Roll Club. All right, friends. So let's go ahead and get started now that we have our recap. And uh, okay. So for this particular block, you're going to need four strips of red uh, for the poinsettias. Now, after I, I wrote my instructions and I said, you're gonna need four strips of red and you are gonna need four strips of red to make um, these poinsettias because you're gonna need um, those strips. I'm gonna make three of these for my quilt. Um, 
I decided I wanted to, to have different colors. I decided I didn't want them all to be the same. You know, like in this one, all of the print is the same. It's a batik. And so I had a lot of different batiks, and so I just decided to pick a few that were similar in value. That means the amount of color or saturation. And then I decided that these were going to be my poinsettias. All right, so let's get started. In your pattern, which is available on our website, which is www.jellyrollclub.com, you can download the handout. Um, you can also go to the Facebook page and you can download the handout there um, because I post everything there and I also post it in the community tab of the channel if you ever miss anything. That's all the places that I post it. I'm also working on a new website. My girls are helping me out, so I'm pretty excited to have a, a website that's going to be easier to navigate. So I'm glad you guys are here. Um, there's 89 of us now, so we're getting full. Okay. So your pattern for this block is just like this. And if you notice, I've printed it mine on cardstock. And then I have labeled my uh, blades on my Dresden as such. And this one has to be cut in a specific way. If you notice, I left it attached. And let me show you how I cut this. So I just came in with my Teflon scissors don't use your good fabric scissors for this. They will get dull. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. You're just going to take and you're going to cut these. Your uh, template has like a little drawn center, like little dashed lines. And you're going to stop right at those dashed lines. And you're just going to come in from the sides and you're going to cut along this curve just because it makes more accurate pieces. So you're just gonna come in from the outside and you're gonna want those curves to be smooth and you're gonna cut till you reach the center. Then once you do that, you're gonna leave it attached, you're gonna snip these. And it took a lot of playing with math and a lot of drawing to get the shape that I wanted. But once you have a vision in your head, it's hard to get that vision out. And so I just kept at it until I made the flower, this paper piece template exactly the way that I wanted. Somebody wants to know about the quilt behind me. The quilt behind me is called the Ring of Fire. And uh, I did a live stream on the Ring of Fire. It's on the Facebook page and there's also a free pattern I made that quilt for my granddaughter. She is in love with Fruit Loop cereal. So as you can see, I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can. There you go. And so my granddaughter loves Fruit Loop cereal. And so the Ring of Fire quilt was made for her. All right. So there we have it. So this is what it needs to look like. And you need to leave them attached because... If you're off in any of your cutting, you're going to want to keep them in the same exact order they belong in, right? And I cut the curves to avoid cutting into them with the scissor because if you cut this first, you can cut into this and you want to leave that in one piece. So I, you're just going to cut it just like that, right? And so you're going to end up with a shape that looks like this. Um, I write my numbers on them because those are um, how I figure out my way around the world. And so be careful not to get paper cuts. I got a couple of paper cuts doing this. I was like, I don't know. This is the year that I've had a lot of accidents, I guess. I chopped my finger earlier in the year and I've had several paper cuts. <laughs> but oh well. I'm also trying to recover from a horrible bout with adult RSV. I don't know if any of you guys have been sick, but this has been a terrible winter for illness in my family. Okay, so now we have it, right? Save these pieces. You can use those for um, small hexagon paper piece projects. So don't throw those away. That's what I'm saving mine for, little mini projects. So you're just gonna chop it like this and you're gonna leave it attached because you're gonna work at these blades one at a time. 
So once you have that, you're going to take the very first blade and you're going to fold it in like this. And you're going to chop it and you're going to work on this one first. Now, you have to decide what fabric you want. And so I measured this and the piece that fits um, these particular uh, pieces is a four inch piece. So I took my jelly roll strips, which were two and a half inches wide by width of fabric, and I cut them four inches wide so that I had enough to do each of my paper pieced pieces. And so what I did is I just took this and I set this over here to the side. I work one blade at a time. And you don't have to start with one, I just did. And the first thing that I did is I got my bottle of faultless starch. Any inexpensive starch will do. You don't have to spend a ton of money on something expensive. Put a little bit in the cap. I wash this when I'm done, but just put a little in the cap. And using a, a paintbrush that you don't care about, and I just use this for random little things, I took and I folded this over on the end and I basted that edge, just the edge like that with a little bit of starch. And then I take my handy dandy little um, ironing board and I folded that in just like that. I could feel that edge, make sure it's butted up tight against there and just give it a hard press. And so that made a nice crease there. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trim that off. I'm gonna leave about a half inch seam allowance. It's a little bit wider than a traditional quarter inch seam allowance in quilting. And so I'm gonna leave that just like that. Because this is the top of my flower, I'm gonna want crisp edges. Now you have two kinds of curves here. You have convex and concave, right? So you have this inner curve and you have this outer curve. Anytime you have an inner curve, you're gonna wanna clip just a little bit. And so I'm gonna start here and I'm going to visualize a line that's about a quarter of an inch away. So if you go about a fourth of an inch away from that line, and you can put a couple little dots if you're not sure, but just put a couple little dots. You're gonna leave a fourth of an inch and you're gonna come in and you're gonna do some clipping here. So you're gonna clip about a half inch away from the end and then you're gonna clip again, clip again, clip again, clip again. And you're gonna see that that's necessary because as we turn this, we can ease that into that curve by using those little clips. So you're again, you're gonna put the starch on the outside of the fabric, not the inside, because you don't wanna get your paper wet. And you can reuse this paper several times, that way you can save photocopies. And you're just gonna take, and on this side, you're gonna feel for that, and you're gonna brush a little bit of starch on that back side. It makes the fabric very, very easy to work with, very pliable. And then you're going to hold it like this with your fingers. I feel like I need extra fingers for this task. And then you're gonna press it down, just like that. And I love working with batiks for this particular um, method because it holds a nice crisp edge. And so I love batiks for this project. And so by clipping that excess, it makes that nice sharp turn right there. Do you see that? It's a nice sharp corner. Now this, I'm going to um, trim at an angle because I want to reduce the bulk down here at the bottom. So I'm going to come in from this point here at the bottom and I'm going to come in at a 45 and trim that off. And so that leaves me less bulk when I get ready to turn that corner. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn that corner just like that. And I'm going to bring it in and I'm going to give it a press, just like that. And don't burn your fingers, friends. Use a pin. 
One of my favorite tools to use in the whole wide world is this, uh, I don't know, pimple popper tool they sell, but it's metal and so you can hold, it allows me to push those into place like this. And you hold something down with it and then press it with the iron and then remove it. And they're super cheap, you get a whole set of those. I don't know, for like five or six dollars. Great little tools. All right, so now that, that I've turned that corner, I'm gonna come across here and I'm going to baste the curve. And so this curve, if you noticed, my piece was at a slight angle because I want that fabric to be on the bias. And so I'm gonna brush some of that. You can feel it because the paper's on the other side. And then I'm gonna take it while it's wet and I'm gonna curl it all towards me, just like that. And the reason I didn't trim that short is because I want to be able to have a nice crisp corner. And this one here's a little bit long. So I'm gonna trim that off. And I'm gonna bring that down so that it pushes up against my paper, which is why you wanna leave all of the starch on the outside, not towards the paper, because you don't want that paper to start dissolving on you. But this is good hard cardstock. If you have cereal boxes, this works great with cereal boxes. If you take your um, printed pattern that I gave you and you print it out on regular paper and then you glue it down onto cereal box cardboard, it works really great for this process. All right. I hope you enjoy all my crazy patterns. I just get ideas in my head in the middle of the night and I start sketching and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm drawing another flower, creating another pattern. So now that I have it and it's got its nice perfect shape that I want, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna trim all of this excess and I'm gonna leave it about a half inch away from the edge, just like that. And these little applique scissors are great because you can stick them under there between the cardboard and the uh, fabric and you can avoid cutting your cardboard or wrecking your fabric. So there you have it. It's nice and flat. I can give it another press from the front. And I'm gonna do that to all nine of my petals, okay? All right, so let me show you what happens next. Let me scooch that over. So after you have done this to each one, you're gonna lay them out. And if you notice, these uh, numbers are on the back side. So my flower is gonna end up going in the opposite direction. So it doesn't really matter whether the flower goes this way or that way, it's gonna end up looking the same. Just make sure that you write your numbers on there and that you follow the order, okay? Once you do that to all of your pieces, you're gonna end up with a bunch of basted pieces like this, right? And I chopped these off for demonstration purposes. See, now they're all scrambled. So once you get them, just like I did this one, and like I said, you can flip them either direction. There's no right or wrong. Then I started sewing these in order. So I started with my first one. Leaving the paper in, you're gonna sew these in order. And so let me get the one that goes next to this. And this one will go like this next to it. So once I have this like, uh, this, like this, it's gonna wanna curl up. So what I did is I put, if you noticed, some great big black thread, some basting stitches. So I just took something that was easy to see, for me it was black, and I did some big old jumbotron basting stitches, great big ones, maybe like six. Um, I used this um, inexpensive, you know, Coates and Clark stuff that's indestructible because it's not gonna stay in my quilt and so it doesn't matter, but it's good and strong so I can pull on it and pull it through the paper. And so this is the, the purpose of this thread for me is I use it for these kinds of little tasks. If you wanna be fancy, you can use a needle threader 
or you can be um, vintage like me and just kind of lick your thread. It's up to you if you want to lick it or not. Yes, my duckbill scissors are Tula Pink duckbill scissors. I love these little guys. They're my favorite. All right, so then I take, and I'm going to put a quilter's knot on this black basting thread. Great big knot. And I'm going to baste on the front. So I'm going to start on the front in any of these corners. It doesn't really matter. And I'm just going to take and do great big giant basting stitches. Anywhere that there's like a pleat or a tuck, if your thread tangles, you can use some thread magic. But I use great big embroidery needles because they're big, they're thick and strong. They have a big eye. And so I'm just gonna go right through here. It takes but a few seconds. This is great stuff to do if you're going to the doctor's office, like I've been to the doctor a couple of times over the last couple of weeks because I was so, so sick. If you can avoid getting adult RSV friends, please do. It makes you very, very sick. All right. So there you have it. Then I come back to the end and I'm coming to the front. So the knot is in the front. And if you notice, there's just like six, like one, two, three, four, five, six big stitches and that's it. Leave those tails long like this because we are going to be removing that once we attach it to its friends, right? And I'm going to put it back with its partner. See how this is going this way and these are going the opposite way? I'm going to put that with its friends so I don't lose it. Okay, so once you've basted those, now you get to attach them to its partner, right? And the beauty of English paper piecing, which by the way, is a technique that uh, became popular in England in the 1700s. And it came to the US and it was first published in ladies magazines. They started the first set of templates in the early 1800s. So for those of you who are history buffs, that's how long we have been English paper piecing um, in this country since the early 1800s when those magazines became popular. But the thing about English paper piecing is you don't require a lot of supplies other than paper. And some of the vintage quilts, they've been able to date them because of the paper that was often left inside. People used um, newspapers, magazines, catalogs, and in some of the older magazines, they literally just left all of those um, papers in there. And so English paper piecing is great because it's extremely accurate. And it's also great because you can sew and make use of even the tiniest of little pieces. All right, so now I'm gonna get a piece of thread that's about 18 inches long, single strand um, cotton thread. You can use quilting thread for this if you would like, but I just use cotton thread because this one is gonna be appliqued and stitched down. If I were doing, um, true English paper piecing, I might get a slightly thicker thread than this thread. Okay, so I'm just gonna use a single strand of thread and I'm gonna create what is called a little tiny ladder stitch and I'm gonna draw one so that you can understand what I'm doing. So I'm gonna pull this down just a hair. You're gonna need to see up close. So a ladder stitch is a stitch that literally looks like rungs on a ladder. So I'm gonna come in on one side and I'm gonna stick my needle right where this edge is because I don't want it to be on either side. So right along this edge, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna stick my needle in from the back and I'm gonna come out through that seam. And so I'm gonna come out on one side like this, then I'm gonna to go to the opposite piece of thread fabric and I'm gonna come in on the opposite side. Then I'm gonna travel just a tiny bit this way and have my needle come out. Then I'm gonna travel this way just a little bit and have my needle come out. And so I'm gonna continue this stitching that literally creates little rungs on a ladder, right? 
as I sew. And let me show you what that looks like, okay? You guys with me so far? I'm not getting too fast or too confusing. All right, and look at what happens. So this is what it looks like after I'm done, right? In the back, you can trim all that stuff up. So when I'm done, I have little tiny stitches, and let me show you how that comes about. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna come from the back, and I'm gonna travel out into that corner. So you see that corner? I'm gonna come out. So I'm gonna bury the knot inside there. And then I'm gonna come up the side a tiny bit, and I'm gonna get, put my needle between the paper and the fabric, and I'm gonna come out this side. Then I'm gonna make sure that I abut this right next to it so that I know where it's going, and I'm gonna take this one, and I'm gonna come out from the back through that corner, just like that along that edge. And I'm gonna come out. And then I'm going to make sure that those are lined up. Yeah. If you're the teacher, make sure you're um, putting it on the right corner. Wrong corner. <laughs> Gosh, I need less cold medicine and more coffee, right? Sorry, friends, the beauty of live TV is you get to see it all, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? All right. Back to the drawing board. Let me come back, line it up, and make sure you go the correct corner, not the opposite one. So I'm going to come out. And so that should just butt up against the next piece. I'm going to pull like that. And so now that I have it, I'm going to flip this to the back. And I'm going to flip it open because I want to create my little ladder stitch while I can see both of those edges, right? And so how I'm going to do this is I'm going to travel up one side just like that, just like I did in the little drawing. Take a tiny bite, and then I'm going to come to the other side and take a tiny bite. So I'm traveling along the edges of that paper, so I'm sliding my needle between the paper and the fabric, just like that. Just taking a tiny bite. You guys see that? Taking a tiny bite with my needle between the paper. I just take a tiny, tiny bite, and I'm building those ladder stitches. And then after I take a couple of stitches, I lay those flat, just like that. And then I take my finger and I hold both of these and I pull it snug so that it pulls it together. And so I'm going to keep doing that. This is not a fast process, I can tell you that right now. And if you want to use a shorter thread, that can be helpful. I like to uh, use an 18 inch thread. And I'm going to keep doing that. So I'm just going to keep going. I left those on my earlier pieces out. So I'm just going to keep traveling. I'm going to fold it back. And now I'm going the opposite direction and I'm going to take a tiny bite right there. And I'm going to come out along that nice crisp seam. And this is why it helps to use starch because it makes those seams good and crisp and it keeps them from distorting. Then I'm going the opposite side. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating um, a stitch just like a sewing machine would that it goes back and forth, back and forth, but I'm doing it by hand. Okay, a little tiny, as tiny as you can get it. And then about every couple of stitches, I'm going to lay that flat, just like that, and I'm going to pull it tight, just like that. And what that does is on the other side, it creates these invisible stitches. If you notice, those stitches are invisible because those stitches are now in those two seams that touch each other. Okay, can you guys see my hands? Let's 
so let me stretch out. So let me show you one more time. So you flip it to the back, pull. I lay it down like this so that it, it touches each other. And what I'm doing is I'm just trying to keep those stitches basically right across from the piece that's next to it. You're not going to be able to match them perfectly because there's not two, um, when they're touching each other, because there's not two flat edges. And so what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I line up the opposite sides. And then once I get to about two or three stitches, then I do the same thing. I lay it flat. I pull it tight. And it's like a little ladder stitch like you would do to mend some pants. And you do that for the entire length of your petal till you get here. Once you get here, you're going to you're going to tack it and then you're going to backtrack about halfway down and you're going to stop. And so let me try to do this a little bit faster. So this once you get going, um, this can be actually pretty fast. And you can just kind of go both sides. Keeping your thread tangle free is the biggest challenge of this thing. Like I said, you can use a little thread conditioner, pull those tight, and go opposite sides of that seam, if that makes any sense. So let me angle that. And so once I have that, like I said, I can get to the top. Now the other way of doing this, if you don't want to use that little ladder stitch like I've been doing, that leaves the most hidden um, thing is you can come in and do like a little whip stitch from the side. So if you wanted to, you can just kind of whip stitch across both of those. This is a, a pretty easy thing to do. And you just kind of whip stitch at a diagonal. That can leave a little bit of a ridge, so I avoid that one if I can. But you can also just kind of come in at an angle and whip stitch those together. Now knowing how this is constructed, you're going to want to pay attention when you um, applique this down to your surface that you definitely um, sew um, so a little a little bit of more sewing along this edge and let me talk about what I'm talking let me show you what I'm talking about so once I'm done with this entire flower and I want to applique it to my background I'm going to want to make sure that I stitch about a sixteenth of an inch away from each of these petals just to secure my entire flower to my background, right? And so this is how you build the flower. You just take and you sew all the way across. Let me get to the end of this really quick. This is a great little project for taking with you if your um, kids play basketball. So if, you do, if you're one of those travel ball moms that goes everywhere. If you go places with your family and you have a lot of time on your hands, not a lot of us have time on our hands, but if you do, this is a great little project to take with you, okay? So once you get that there, then you have to remove your papers, right? And how I remove my papers from here, let me just pull that tight and tie it off. Here. Hang on one second. I'm just going to whip stitch this really quick just to show you. I'm going to go back and do a little bit more stitching. So this is a slow, not a, not a quick and easy process. This is a slow process. So break that. So once you sew that together, the next thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to break all of these stitches to pull your paper out. And this is where my duck bills come in handy. You can stick your duck bill in there my nice little sharp scissors. I'm just going to break all of those six stitches I did. Just like that. And using a pair of tweezers or even just your fingers, you're just going to pull those out. Because eventually all those papers are just going to come out. Just going to pull those. And then when you get there, you're going to pull this piece of paper right out. And guess what? You can reuse those. Once I pull my papers out, 
I make sure that I give this a little trim, any kind of stray things that are floating around. And then using a little bit of 100% washable kitty glue, like the kind children take to primary school, you're gonna want to, I'm gonna move all of this extra stuff out of the way. You're going to want to glue these edges down so that your applique piece holds its shape. So you're just gonna take and literally dab it in a couple of places and keep it down. You can also use a pin if you want to, just like that. Just grab a little bit with a pin, run it along that edge like this, push it down, And then you're gonna wanna give this a little press. So I like to press mine just so that it keeps its shape. And so that I know that my block is laying flat and true. So I'm just gonna take and lay it down, make sure that it's nice and flat. And I'm gonna press that together. And that does two things. Is there a special leaf that goes, goes with the poinsettias? If you go back and you look at some of the other leaves I had before, um, the leaves to the poinsettia plant um, are pretty much the same as here. Let me show you which one I posted had leaves. Uh, let me pull back. Hang on. The similar one as the sunny sunflower. So if you, you see the sunny sunflower leaf template, you can use the same template with the poinsettias because the leaves on the poinsettia plant are very similar. Okay, and so this is how you start to build your sunflower. Am I making sense, friends? Does this make sense to you guys what I'm doing here? Let me move this, all right. So now this is what we have, right? Is our big um, flower just starts to grow. And so once you get it like this, you're just gonna keep adding all of those leaves that you've basted all the way around. And just the same way that I did the first one, you're gonna add all of the other ones, okay? Am I making sense, friends? All right, so let me show you what happens once you're done with an entire flower and you wanna pull the papers off. And I'm gonna use my little um, forget-me-not. So here's my little forget-me-not. If you notice, I had all of these little red threads on here. And so just like this one, it had paper in the back. This one had paper in the front. And this is why I love batik. So this is a batik. I'm gonna take and I'm gonna trim all this extra stuff off because I didn't trim these very small. I like to leave a nice big, a generous amount of fabric because I'm pulling them in with my fingers and that gives me the ability to, um, to really kind of shape the flowers and that's why I do that. All right, so I'm gonna take this. And so this, my friends, is for Victoria Lip who asked me how to remove the papers and how to finish up this piece once I was done. So I just take all of these basting stitches and pull them straight out. You can use a pin. So you just take your scissor and you remove every bit of this. And if you have any questions at all about quilting, any type of question at all, let me know. Um, I could do a whole session on frequently asked quilting questions, burning questions that you have about Dresden's, about applique, because we've been doing a lot of that lately. So once you trim all of those, you literally just start pulling them out. And that's why you have the great big giant um, Stitches. If you have an eraser to a pencil, this is a great thing to do with an eraser. If they won't come out, then you might need to clip something else. See, like that one's not clipped. So pull all those out. Sometimes you need a tweezer, like good old-fashioned tweezers, like you would tweeze your 
eyebrows with and that sometimes just makes it faster so just pull them out with tweezers like this I have some very unusual tools in my sewing room friends right pimple poppers and tweezers today So don't be afraid to use things that are not usually quilting tools and use those for whatever purposes you have. If you use an unusual tool in the sewing room, you can drop that in the comments and share a, a pointer with the rest of us. What kind of tools do you use in the sewing room? Did I try a knot in that? There we go. You guys have any unusual quilting tools you use. Yes, a lint roller is great for this kind of stuff. Look at that. Pull that out. And just literally pull every bit of that. I like these little scissor tweezers. Pulls threads right out. When I have to um, use Jack the Ripper, and pull out stitches. I like to use my tweezer. Okay, so let's get rid of all of this mess. And yes, this is messy, so you're gonna end up covered in little threads. And now that you have your entire flower, you can just pop uh, first, before I pop the papers out, I'm gonna give this a little um, spritz of starch. And so I'm gonna leave that paper back in and I'm gonna give it a little spray of starch on the back to make sure that those papers, uh, that those things don't pull away from the papers. Let me pull up my camera so you can have a better angle. And so I'm just gonna starch those down. Now I'm gonna flip this over and I'm gonna give it a, another little spray from the front. You see how nice it's holding its shape? Now I can pop all those papers out, every one of those. Normally I would let it dry a little bit more, but I'm trying to show you what I do. I'm gonna give these a little trim. Just pull all those little papers out. Don't be afraid to get them out of there. It's gonna hold its shape really, really well. I'm gonna flip it over. I like to put something heavy on there, like a tailor's clapper or even a wooden cutting board. You can lay something on top and just give it another little press. All right, so now that I have it, I can give it a little trim. All of those excess cement reach the, get in there and get rid of that bulk, right? because I left those kind of big, and the reason I left them big is so that I could pull all those nice and tight around where I wanted those, right? So once you have pulled all of that excess out and trim those to about a half inch, it just kind of reduces the bulk and lets your flowers lay nice and flat. You can either leave it like this and it's ready to applique, or you can take, like I said before, and add a little tiny bit of um, glue for children. It's 100% washable. I've used it on dozens of projects and it washes right out. Uh, the pimple popper, I got it on Amazon, this little thing right here. It came as a set of five and they're great in the sewing room. And so now that I have that, guess what? This little pimple popper tool is great for grabbing a little bit of um, glue if I want to just grab a little bit and poke it down in here. Just like that. And you push it down with your finger. And you push it down in there. Just a tiny bit, not a lot. You just grab it. Push it down in there and it holds all of those little bits together. I, put, I keep it away from the outer edges where I'm going to be sewing. And I literally just use it in those big um, seam allowances so it can hold its shape the way that I want. 
I think it helps that I use batiks because batiks don't fray like regular quilting cotton does and so I'm just taking some of that and pushing it down underneath those edges super helpful push it all the way down move it around and voila it takes all of those little edges and holds them down perfectly so you can stack a bunch of these in your sewing room and then get to them later on at a later date like I said anytime that you have little pieces that want to poke up or curl the opposite direction you're just going to stick a little bit of school glue in there and you're going to have these perfect little flowers and now you can take all these papers that you've numbered, right? One, two, three, four, five, just like that. You're going to take these little ones and you're going to use them again. So that's why I love doing this method because it's, uh, it saves you money. You can just use these papers. You can use these papers a dozen times and they don't get distorted if they're just made out of cardstock or cereal box. All right, friends, that is it. It is 2.51. I was trying to keep this lesson to about an hour and so let me just talk about what's going to happen next we have a few more um we have a few more classes in this series so the next thing that we're going to be talking about if you look at the calendar on the website um, it'll tell you that for the dresden project we've got several months coming up so in uh, january we're going to be working on creating a background for your flowers I'm going to give you a variety of, um, I'm going to be giving you a variety of leaves. Um, we're also going to have bugs that we're going to be adding to our quilt. So we're going to add little ladybugs. Uh, you're going to get stems. You're going to make a, a butterfly out of some, uh, some templates that I'm going to provide you. And so you're going to have a variety of things to finish to add to this quilt. And then the grand finale is putting all of the pieces together. Now you have two options for creating a background for this um, quilt. You can either um, take the blocks and put blocks together and do it in segments, or you can take and do a whole cloth background. And I'm going to be showing you guys Two different ways to finish this particular project but you keep making your flowers um, just like this it's going to take you a while to do these it takes about two hours to do each flower with nine petals so I'm going to keep working on these and then when you're done you're going to finish these poinsettias just like I did this little forget-me-not um, if I wanted to I could fold the centers but all that's missing now is the center for this little forget-me-not but this is how we're going to build this poinsettia flower I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you are new to this series, please go back to the beginning and watch all of the other um, episodes because I try to go in order and I try to explain a different technique as it relates to a single quilt every single month. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this pattern. I hope you're going to get out there and try a little bit of English paper piecing. It is one of my favorite methods for having super accurate complex shapes that you can put together and it doesn't require anything except needle and thread and your imagination. So um, thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate it. If you will do me a huge favor and like the channel, subscribe, share it with your friends. Um, I am so excited that I'm able to share my things with you guys because the purpose of this channel is to help other people learn how to sew without too many fancy materials and supplies. I mean, our grandmothers did. Uh, learn how to quilt without all of the modern conveniences that we have now. Our modern tools are wonderful, but quilting doesn't have to be um, fancy or expensive. All right, friends, I love you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday. It's almost Christmas. I'm going to be doing another live stream later on tonight at 9 p.m. because I'm going to show you guys how to make gingerbread cookie ornaments. And so I'm making a series of gingerbread cookie ornaments. I'm going to be live every single night at 9 p.m., um, Eastern time on my channel and I'm going to make one different ornament for the tree from starting tonight all the way through the middle of the month and so I hope you join me for that I'm going to post the link on YouTube and I'm also going to post the link on Facebook 
I appreciate it, you guys. Have a wonderful day. Um, happy sewing. You guys have a great Sunday. Bye, friends. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Don't forget.